Hey gang, welcome to Time in the Market, the investing channel with a long-term focus. Today I'm taking a look at CrowdStrike Holdings, ticker CRWD. This is a company that's based in the United States that is in the cybersecurity tech space. They offer their product through their Falcon platform, which is a pretty customizable platform, which allows customers to essentially select what type of security services they want, whether it's managed endpoint security, XDR, cloud security, threat intelligence, identity protection, observability, log management, that sort of stuff, managed services, security and IT operations, etc. And it allows those customers to essentially bring all of those services under one platform, whether it's to save costs, to make things more simple, to automate things, etc. They are certainly moving into that AI space, machine learning space, a lot of local and cloud ML models, uh, AI powered models, and all of that good stuff that the market seems to love these days. Uh, they have quickly become one of the biggest players in this space. A 2022 IDC Worldwide Modern Endpoint Security Market Shares report basically ranked them number one with about 18% market share. And while uh, there are certainly other players in this space, whether it's VMware, Sentinel One, Palo Alto Networks, etc., and a bunch of other legacy players like Microsoft, um, even Google is moving to the space, they have kind of carved out their niche as that number one player that allows people to consolidate things and do things really well. And that's led to really, really good growth and the market rewarding it with a very uh, healthy valuation. We'll take a look at their earnings today, kind of go over quickly what the company does, uh, and then look at whether the valuation still makes sense. FYI, this is a company whose shares I do own. Uh, I bought quite a healthy position when this dropped into the low 100s earlier this year and have been kind of rewarded with a quick return year to date. This company is up 61%, so I'm gonna take a look at whether it still makes sense to hold it whether the valuation is a bit too rich for my blood, whether it makes sense to sell it and or buy more because earnings were just announced and they seem to be pretty good. However, if you bought a bit earlier, you know, the one year return is about negative 2.9%. So this is another one of those companies that has had its swings in recent years. Technology was very richly valued in that 2020, 2021, 2022 space. And now that interest rates have risen up, the valuations have come down a little bit, especially for companies whose growth is slowing and or starting to get a bit less impressive. However, if you were a holder since IPO, this company IPO'd in 2019, so the long-term track record isn't really there yet. Like I said, this is a pretty young company, but one that has done very well for itself in terms of their growth and their ability to take market share, which does speak to the quality of their product. Since IPO, this is a 123% overall return or about 21% per year. So good performance there. We'll take a look at financials in more details, but we can kind of take a look at their earnings. And I will link this investor brief that I had opened, kind of going through their business model, what they do, how they're better than legacy AVs. They're more proactive versus reactive as some of these other players. They have, you know, next generation threat analysis, AI power pre prevention, et cetera. And they really go into the details of what they do, how they're better, how they're different, how they are able to take market share. And not only that, but how they're able to take their platform that used to offer just one thing and kind of expand it and increase their total accessible market by doing that. So looking at their corporation and their earnings, yeah, it's an important part to understand the business model, but you can kind of see that they're, they're see, they see themselves as a category defining cloud platform. There's HR cloud, there's cloud service management, there's CRM cloud, but these are the guys in the security cloud space and they are the number one player. And you can kind of see their Q2 earnings at a glance. They are just shy of 3 billion in annual recurring revenue. Annual recurring revenue is growing at 37%. And if you look at software as a service in general, Annual recurring revenue is a buzzword. Everybody loves it because it's something that is a subscription model. You get revenue every year. You can keep growing it. And the beautiful thing about their business model is they, as they add more modules, as they add more services to their Falcon platform, they can say, well, listen, you already have these four different things that we're doing for you. Maybe you can add identity protection. And if you listen to their earnings call, they really talked about some of the additional services that are now reaching $100 million to 500 million in annual recurring revenue on their own. So it's not just this one thing that they offer, it's other things like you can add, you know, identity protection, security and IT operations, uh, log management, all of that stuff. And all of that leads to uh, more stickiness with customers and also better 
revenue growth and, and annual revenue growth and the ability to grow revenue with each customer. Um, and at the end of the day, that ends up leading to really good free cash flow margins, really good operating margins. So this is a company that's, you know, basically 10, 12 years into its existence. It's already hitting $3 billion in revenue. It's growing really quickly. The growth is obviously slowing as the revenue gets bigger. The, the growth off that revenue baseline that's higher is going to be slower. But it's hitting good margins, it's profitable, it's generating free cash flow. Um, and you can kind of see the free cash flow rule of 40, which is a software as a service um, item that basically says, well, revenue growth plus free cash flow margins, if it's above 40%, you're doing pretty well. Uh, so they talk about the problem here, how inflexible some of these other players are, how flexible CrowdStrike can be, really focused on the AI stuff. And the interesting thing is a couple of, uh, Months ago, they, they sort of said, well, the AI boom is happening and we've got Charlotte, which is our answer to chat GPT, essentially, in the uh, cybersecurity space. And they kind of talked about what Charlotte can do. And it's not really just a chat bot, but they kind of gave, gave an example of what does a tier one analyst do for a company today? Well, they, they kind of log in, they, they go through alert triage, they try to figure out what's going on, what they have to work on, what the priority is, what what kind of uh, adversaries are there in their industries and how they can get access to the assets of the company. Well, they can just, you know, if they subscribe to Charlotte as part of the Falcon platform, they can kind of come in and talk to her. It's like, well, Charlotte, they use that specific name all the time. What are the latest threats that CrowdStrike knows about? Because this chatbot is obviously going to have all of the threat intelligence that CrowdStrike has gathered and continues to gather through their platform with all of the companies they work for, work with rather. Um, what are adversaries doing in their industries? How is that potentially putting the assets at my company at threat? What are assets that might be exposed? What can I do? Is there a patch I can roll out? And let's say Charlotte says, here's some steps you can take. And the analyst can say, well, okay, let's roll out a patch, create a PowerShell script for me, uh, use one of your uh, Falcon modules, Falcon Fusion, which is basically the automated workflow module they have um, to, to roll that out. So there's this whole workflow that Charlotte can build out for you, automates it for you, uh, rolls out the patch, and then when it's done, it could write a report for you. So really as an analyst, if I work in that industry, I think, crap, this thing is gonna take my job eventually or at least make it so that we don't need 20 analysts anymore, we just need two. Uh, and that's a bad thing for <laughs> analysts, but it can be a really good thing for CrowdStrike and their ability to sort of grow that platform, charge more money for that platform. Because if, even if you're charging a lot, that can still save a company money uh, in the long run because you're no longer having to employ 30, 40 analysts or however many you have for a large company, and depending on the size of your company. It could be more, it could be less for smaller companies. But now you're just working with a couple, and these couple are really trained on the CrowdStrike uh, Falcon platform uh, and are using generative AI to make that happen. So again, it's really in the early stages of that that process, but obviously um, CrowdStrike is a company that has taken on a lot of market share. They've done a good job in actually identifying threats and fixing them and or defending against them. And all of that data flowing in is going to help them train these models uh, to be better. Um, and it, it could be this sort of thing where you know, the, the person who's in the lead will continue to be in the lead because they have the most data to use to train these models, to innovate, et cetera. But obviously there's other players in this space that are always targeting, they're always challenging. Uh, remember, this is a company that just started in 2011 and it's already the dominant player. So it doesn't take long for somebody to come out and say, well, we're gonna upend how things are done. And while CrowdStrike is in the number one position right now, are there other players Players like you know Zscaler, Sentinel One, which isn't doing that hot these days. Uh, Wiz, all of these other up-and-coming players. Some of these other legacy players um, are still in the space, and obviously they have a they have a ton of money to throw at these problems to uh, challenge what um, CrowdStrike is doing. So, talking about the platform itself, yada yada yada. Moving on, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I urge you to read through this stuff to listen to some of their earnings calls. Um, really interesting stuff if you're interested in this at all, but really I'm focused here on their business and what they do. So I talked about their modules and what the modules allow them to do is really, we started in that corporate, corporate workload security space, but then we added these other modules that are 
ever that they're adding an ever expanding total addressable market to their business. And as the total addressable market grows, the ability to grow their revenue grows as well. You can kind of see that, hey, the total addressable market here in 2023 is about 76 billion. It's growing at a pretty rapid clip up to 97 billion expected by 2025. And you can kind of see the evolution of their total addressable market at IPO. It was only 25 billion. Um, in 2023 at 76 billion through growth of the total addressable market naturally, but also through the addition of the modules that we talked about before. Uh, the current portfolio by 2025, like I said, is gonna be about 98 billion. And then they've got organic growth, a product roadmap, future initiatives, and other opportunities that by you know 2026 are going to expand that total addressable market to over 150 billion. So talking about their financials, this is where the importance comes in. Like I said, this is a company that has grown from, you know, 71 million in uh, annual recurring revenue all the way up to 3 billion growing at a very rapid clip quarter by quarter. Um, the growth is slowing a little bit. We'll talk about what that means in their earnings today. Uh, the revenue growth has been really, really good. 55% subscription year over year growth, 39% revenue growth in the 2024 fiscal year. So you can kind of see the growth is slowing, gone from 55 to 35. The projections for the full year 2024 are somewhere in that 35 to 36% range. So growth is certainly slowing and it's going to drop into that high 20s range probably on a go forward basis and likely continue to soar from there. So you can kind of see why the valuation has normalized a little bit. Obviously at a hundred bucks, maybe it was a bit underpriced or at least I thought so, but potentially near $300, it was a bit overpriced with revenue slowing to where it has. Um, the beautiful thing about this business is that retention's there, gross retention is in that 98% plus range and getting better in the last couple of years. But the net retention, which is important, they kind of have a 120% benchmark. They've beaten that almost basically every quarter since they've gone public. Um, and net retention essentially means that, hey, not only are we renewing the customers that we already have, but we're potentially increasing their rates and or adding additional modules to their plan that allow us to get more revenue from each particular customers. And that's the power of that platform where you can have additional modules so let's rate, let's say right now they have nine modules or something to that effect. 63% of their customers have five or more modules installed. So obviously they can sell more and more of these modules to each individual customers. Only 24% have seven or more modules. So there's a lot of opportunity for internal growth from the simple sales process of, hey, add more modules. We can do these additional services for you. What we can do for you is bring in some of these other services they you may have with another platform, with another business that complicate your business a bit too much, they might cost you more than actually bringing them in-house. Generally, the total cost of um, services are gonna be cheaper when you have it with one, with one business than if you have it spread across eight or nine different businesses uh, because they can just offer uh, that at a cheaper price overall. And also it makes it simpler for your employees to kind of deal with these different products if it's on on one platform. Obviously, the risk is that, hey, if we're all consolidated with CrowdStrike and CrowdStrike ends up sucking, that's a bit of a problem. If CrowdStrike has some issues, that's a bit of a problem, but hopefully that's not an issue in the long term. And we're talking about the attractive economics here. And this is a really good business in general. Software as a service has always been a good business, and that's why the market values it so highly because the margins are fantastic. You can kind of see the gross margins are at 80%. Operating leverage is kind of getting into that 20% range. Uh, free cash flow is getting into that 30% margin range, and it's been there for quite a bit of time. Now, that's maybe a bit misleading on the free cash flow side because a lot of that is driven by them avoiding expenses by offering a lot of stock-based compensation. We'll talk about that soon. But you can kind of see that this is a business that's targeting 20 plus percent operating margins, 30 plus percent free cash flow margins in the long run, and they've been achieving that in recent times, and I don't see any reason why they can't do that on a go-forward basis. So looking at the financials here, we already talked about that. Let's look at kind of their estimates and how their growth has been. 90% growth, 80% growth, 66% growth, 54% growth, down to 35.6% estimated on a go-forward basis for this year. And then the estimates are kind of 
slowing down from there in 27 and 28. There's probably like one guy estimating here, so it's not a lot of valuable data. I'll kind of adjust for that. But you can see the beautiful thing about this business is free cash flow is already there from the beginning of the business. You can kind of see why this business has done so well. Anytime a business can generate free cash flow right from the get-go, that is going to help them not only self-fund their growth, but not to take on additional debt, et cetera. And if you look at their balance sheet, that certainly happened. They've got almost $3 billion in cash, uh, almost, you know, just 741 million, 3 billion in cash, 741 million in debt. So not a lot of, you know, balance sheet is basically pristine. If you look at their cash flow, we talked about their cash flow being positive. But one thing to keep in mind as an investor in some of these early stage growth companies, and this is kind of in that middle growth stage at this point, given that the growth is slowing, is that they do use a lot of stock-based compensation. Uh, while that is a non-cash expense, meaning it, it does help the free cash flows, it is sometimes a negative, well, often a negative for investors because it does dilute current investors. Stock-based compensation means they are issuing options, grants to employees in lieu of higher salaries, which improves their free cash flow. Um, it does, you know, impact their their net income because it, it it does impact that. But from a free cash flow basis, it does make it look better. So, if you're talking about free cash flow in that seven to eight hundred million dollar space, um, well, five hundred. 600 million of that is stock-based compensation that is going to dilute your shareholders. And if you look at their balance sheet, um, the dilution is there. They started with about you know 223 million total shares outstanding uh, in 2021, and now they're up to 238 million. So there's some dilution. It's not a ton of dilution. Uh, it is it it is a big percentage of their overall revenue. If you're talking about 500 million in stock-based compensation versus just shy of three billion in revenue that's you know 20 percent of your revenue in stock-based compensation pretty high some 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 of these sas um companies are in that 40 percent range so it's not ridiculous but it is something to keep an eye on especially if growth ever starts to slow if the stock price is punished a little bit because that is going to uh, be a trade-off that they have to make if employees are incented to stay because their stock price is high, because they're getting a lot of option grants and or uh, stock-based compensation grants in general. Uh, what happens when the stock price, if the stock price ever drops to a very low level because there's a recession, et cetera, are they going to have to switch that to higher salaries to retain employees? How is that going to impact their free cash flow? How is that going to impact their earnings? So keep that in mind. And if you're a long-term investor, how is them continually offering stock-based compensation going to dilute your overall holdings? As long as they keep growing their revenue at a pretty good clip, as long as their free cash flow keeps growing at a pretty good clip and their margins remain steady, it's not really a huge issue because the dilution is you know, maybe in that 1% to 2% a year range at this point. If you're offering $500 million in stock-based compensation against a market cap of almost $40 billion, not really a huge deal. But if you're doing the same thing against a much smaller market cap, it could be a bigger problem. So keep that in mind as an investor. So looking at their financials and we'll jump into their valuation. I also have their estimates here, but I've kind of done my own analysis here. I, I sort of say that, hey, these estimates are kind of optimistic. They're not going to go from 25% back to 36% growth. And I feel like the fact that their margins have slipped a little bit. They're probably going to be in this range on a go forward basis. That's kind of their target. It's highly unlikely that they're suddenly going to jump up to 33, drop down to 32, stay at 32 when right now they're at 30.5%. Um, so potentially some upside here if you think margins are going to keep getting better from where they are today. Potentially some downside if you think they're going to get worse. But I'm kind of assuming that margins in 2024 are probably going to be in that 30.5% range, 30.4% range. We're going to take that going forward. And then as far as growth goes, I'm going to start dropping growth a little bit from where it is today, 36, 28, which is you know relatively reasonable, then 25, 23, 21, instead of that kind of growth pattern we saw here. On the buyback side, I actually have buybacks as a negative in this assumption, simply because they are still offering a lot of stock-based compensation. They're not really buying back shares at the moment. Um, I, I do vaguely remember that they might have had a stock buyback plan in place, but I didn't find anything. So I think that's that's not the case, but potentially with their free cash flow, they could buy back shares to at least offset the dilution uh, that they're seeing. They do have $3 billion in cash on the books, um, so they have the opportunity to buy back shares, but 
they're not doing it at the moment. They're still diluting with stock-based compensation. So I'm taking a negative 32% buyback, which means in the last five years, uh, they're going to issue about $2.5 billion in shares total, which kind of goes in line with what we've seen in the last year or two in that $500 million a year range. Uh, so that's going to be a negative impact to their return. And then they've got a bunch of scenarios planned out based on the free cash flow yield that the market is giving it. So right now, the market's giving it a 1.7%, 1.78% free cash flow yield. Um, I don't think that's realistic on a long-term basis, especially once growth starts to slow. But if you believe that that's going to be the case, you can kind of see, well, it's simple in that, hey, if your revenue growth is going to be at 25% in the next five years and you think that's going to continue forever, which it won't, um, you can kind of see that the valuation could yield very good price appreciation anywhere from 20, you know, up to 25% in total returns per year, even adjusting for buybacks. And buybacks are going to be less impactful the, the higher the valuation is, more impactful the lower the valuation is. Uh, simply because, you know, if you issue 500 million in uh, shares a year and you're issuing those at a 1.78% yield, it's not really a big deal. But if you're issuing them at a 10% yield, it's kind of a big deal from an investor's perspective because you're diluting much more at that 10% yield than you are at the 1.7.8% yield. Um, so the reality is that I think in the long run, a lot of these companies, as growth starts to slow, they're going to get into that three to 5% free cash flow yield range, especially if interest rates remain elevated. So I've got a bunch of those free cash flow yields priced out here. You can kind of see that, hey, if somehow this is priced at this earnings growth rate at a 10% free cash flow yield, which is unrealistic, that would be a negative 12% return from today's prices all the way down to 3% free cash flow yield, which is a 12.3% return at today's prices, even accounting for the stock buybacks at those ranges. Um, so what I've done here is I've kind of laid out a couple of scenarios um, that all equal out to 100%. What's more realistic? You know, I'm putting 30% weighting on the 3% free cash flow yield in 2028, 30% weighting on the 4% free cash flow yield. So really kind of trying to stay within that 1.8 to 5% range, more focus on 3 to 4% um, and assigning a fair value based on a target return of 10% to each of those scenarios. Uh, and once added up, those scenarios kind of produce a fair value of 158 bucks, uh, which kind of makes sense to me. When I was buying the stock, it was a hundred at a hundred bucks. And that was basically saying that, hey, based on the growth rates that I'm projecting, based on the margins that I see for this company in the next couple of years, um, $108 today would make this a 10% return at a 5% future free cash flow yield, which is a really good deal in my mind for something running uh, at this growth rate, for something running with these types of margins. Even with the dilution out there, I think this has the potential to grow at a better clip than what I'm assuming here. And there's some potential upside from that number. So if this stock was still at 100 bucks, 110 bucks, would I be buying more of it? Yeah, but that's not where it is today. It's trading at $166. So I'm assuming that some of these scenarios are more valid than others. Um, ideally, I would target something like this at a three to five percent clip, which is where I'm putting the majority of my scenario weighting. You know, it's basically eighty percent in that three to five percent range, slight weighting to that one point seven point one point seven percent yield that it's trading at today, and then a little bit of weighting in that six to seven percent yield and nothing in that eight to 10% yield, because that just seems unrealistic for a company growing like this. Obviously, your opinion can differ. Um, and that's the beauty of investing. You're kind of doing your own analysis. And, and as always, guys, this is a, a video for entertainment purposes only. So please do your own due diligence for <coughs> any, <coughs> any investment decisions you make. And as always, if you like the video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and let me know what you guys think about this sort of analysis where you're sort of saying, well, there's a bunch of scenarios out there. I'm going to plan out the, the ones that I, I find most likely and put a weighting towards those scenarios and then come up with a fair value based on those scenarios. Because at the end of the day, investing is difficult. You know, coming up with valuations is difficult and you kind of have to figure out what the most likely turn scenario is and wait towards those. And that's what I'm doing here. So with these weightings in mind, 
Um, the fair value is kind of around where the stock is trading today. If you're aiming for a 10% return, it's maybe 5% lower than the stock price is today. So this to me says that this isn't a banging deal right now, but it's not a terrible deal. Now, obviously you can have a different mindset. You can say that, hey, potentially your assumption that you're gonna get a five to 7% free cash flow yield on a growth name like this is absolutely ridiculous. Interest rates are not gonna stay elevated for long. The the days of you know four to 5% real yields on actually four to five percent yields on bonds are short in nature uh, and if that's the case then maybe you need to put more weighting on the 1.8 percent yield the four percent yield the three percent yield and basically no weighting on the seven to five percent yields and that will make your fail value a lot higher maybe your target return um is different than mine. Maybe you agree with the scenarios, but you're targeting something like a 12% return. In that case, your fair value is closer to $144. Maybe you're targeting 15% because you're a conservative investor and you think you can get 10% just from the S&P 500. Why would you risk it with an individual stock? You need something a lot higher. Um, that's a $126 fair value. So, you know, 23 bucks off, 23% off where we are today. And for me, um, you know, for, for me, I think this is, a realistic assumption that if I'm targeting 10%, uh, I want maybe a little bit of upside. Um, I, I'll build in, you know, a 10% margin of safety or something like that. That gets me to $142 pie point. But as somebody who holds the shares today, I feel comfortable just continuing to hold because the fair value that I've I've got here isn't that far off the price today. Now, like I said, when I bought the stock, it was 100 bucks. If it was 100 bucks again today, um, you're, you're basically saying that I'm gonna get you know, a 20% return off of the fair value that I'm tar calculating based on these assumptions. But even without those assumptions in place, I'm basically saying that at 108 bucks, this is a 5% free cash flow yield in the future. Um, at 137 bucks, it's a 4% free cash flow yield in the future, et cetera. Uh, it seems pretty good. Now, this is kind of my base scenario. There's obviously some downside in here that I can build in. Let's say the growth starts slowing faster than expected instead of 25 it's 24 instead of 23 it's 20 instead of 21 it's 15 and there's margin pressure in the next couple of years they continue making that same uh stock based compensation that they have today meaning a negative buyback you can kind of see that same exact assumptions um because the growth is so much slower the price is a lot different and that's one of the reasons that when i look at this today it's at 158 dollar fair value i don't feel super comfortable buying it but okay holding it because the downside can be severe, right? The changes here that I'm making aren't huge. It's just slightly slower growth happening earlier and then some margin pressures and your fair value drops by almost you know, 30 bucks here. Uh, that's a pretty big difference. Uh, and a lot of that is simply driven by, you know, you're putting so much of your weight on this scenario that is, and even though it's 10%, the valuation here is so much higher than the valuations in these other scenarios that it's still giving off a lot of um, price impact on that fair value calculation. Um, and when that growth starts to slow, when those margins start to drop quicker than you expect, that can have a pretty big impact to your valuation. You know, you can go to 10% growth here and suddenly it's 123 bucks. You can go to 25% margins here and suddenly it's $119. So really the question is going to be, do you believe in their ability to grow um, at least at a 20% clip out into 2028. Do you believe in their ability to at least continue to get 30% margins out into 2028? And that's a lot of assumptions. Uh, and the reality is that the reason stocks like these drop so quickly, you know, they, they went from $280 to $100 in, in, in the flick of your fingers. It's because an earnings announcement would come out that could say, well, you know, we, we sort of assumed 30% growth, but now it's suddenly 25. And it's like, well, it's only 3% miss. But when you extrapolate this into 2028, that 3% miss compounded across, you know, four different years is going to be a lot. Suddenly there's an earnings announcement that says, well, our margins are now 28%. It's like, wow, that that's not huge. It's only a 2% shift. But because the stock is often priced to perfection, because the yield the market is giving it is sub 2%, when you can get 4 to 5% yields from bronze, that small miss can make a huge difference in price. So for something like this, when I'm already kind of deep in terms of my holdings here, I do own a decent amount of these shares. Um, if 
I feel comfortable holding it still at this price point, but if the stock keeps running, it's gone up a couple bucks in the last couple of days. If it goes up to, you know, 180, $200 again at that price point, I'm going to be like, well, you know, maybe this is something that I need to take off the table because it's getting a bit rich from what, from what I'm seeing. Um, for you, maybe it may be different. Your assumptions may be more, more aggressive. Um, I'm always a bit of a conservative investor, especially with how the marketplace is, is priced at right now. You are in a spot where interest rates are four to five percent, right? If that is a short term phenomenon, doesn't really matter from the perspective of long term returns for stocks like this that are priced at a sub two percent yield. But if those rates stay at four to five percent for years and years and years, and there's no sign of them dropping, the long term returns for stocks like these at today's prices could be mediocre. And you can kind of see what that is when you start looking at these returns from the perspective of 4% plus free cash flow yields, right? They're not great. They're, you know, even at a 4% yield, it's like a 5.8% total return. That's not great. That's not amazing. You're really betting on the market still valuing this at 3% plus to drive the overall returns here. Um, and that's not the ideal bet. So for me at today's prices, it's not amazing at, you know, a hundred bucks. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be buying like I was buying before. Um, but because the risk is a bit high on the downside, um, I'm not super in love with this at today's prices, even if the fair value is just off of where it is um, today. I think there's just too much um, downside potential here. Um, so while I'm not selling, I will continue to hold. I'm already, you know, up 60%. So <laughs> the stock could drop quite a bit more and I could still be positive. Um, and honestly, I do really like what the company is doing. I do like their strategy in terms of introducing new modules, introducing the generative AI aspect of their business, uh, and just growing at a good clip, continuing to generate free cash flow margins. I think they can, you know, drive growth through other things. They're, they have a balance sheet that's really fantastic. They can acquire more of these smaller security companies, especially as valuations kind of normalize. They'll be in a good spot to acquire, grow, and even potentially expand this growth rate in the future if that happens if they can take mar more market share etc but always you know this is a competitive place um there's new players new entrants coming into the space all the time it, like i said these guys basically started in 2018 in terms of growing their revenue in 2018 and by 2022 they were the number one market share what's to say somebody else can't start in 2021 and by 2025 be the number one market share right it's it's a very quick moving space. So it's not a stock that I have that I'm going to put hundred percent of my money in, but you know, a little bit of my money is in here and I feel pretty good about it, but I know that there is risk. So that's it. Let me know your thoughts about your, about CrowdStrike. If you hold it, if you don't hold it, if you're interested in buying it, if you feel like the price is too high, too low, et cetera, as always, please do your own due diligence, due diligence before making any investment decisions. Thanks for watching and have a good rest of your day.